get big, get niche, or get out. That's the advice my guest today has for any bricks and mortar retailers. And he should know. He's the pioneering founder of one of Australia's most successful online department stores. And I've got to tell you, he doesn't hold back. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day listeners and welcome back to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some great marketing and that is why we exist around here. Big show today, team. I am back from the Great Vic bike ride. I want to give you an update on that. Some sort of big news. Big news in my world. Maybe not so much in yours, but I think you'll be interested nonetheless. Got a great guest, Paul Greenberg, Executive Chairman of the National Online Retailers Association. And he's going to give us a bit of an update on the state of retailing online and off. Got a listener question how to implement ideas. Got a real quick answer for that one. And of course, motivational marketing quote of the week. Let's get stuck right in. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Okay, so I am back from the Great Vic bike ride with a fractured right elbow. Yep. In the plaster, in the sling, doing it real slow. <laughs> All it means I can do is I can record and I can make phone calls. And I have actually been using voice to text on my MacBook Pro, which is proving to be fairly accurate. I would actually, I'd say 95 or 90 to 95% accurate. Still a little bit of typing correction required, but it's okay. Great Vic bike ride. It was a 500 kilometer ride across nine days from uh, Albury in New South Wales down into Lilydale in Victoria. Probably means nothing for you if you aren't a Victorian. Um, however, I was doing it with my daughter along with 3,800 other people. And I got to day three and I had an accident. Yeah. Bummer that. Fell off the bike and fractured the elbow. But that said, it was one of the most, it was probably the best personal experience just doing the bike ride I'd had all year. Certainly hanging around with my beautiful daughter was fantastic. But there's some marketing lessons in the bike ride and in me fracturing my arm. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I trust Timbo to find the uh, connection between doing a bike ride and some marketing lessons, but there are. And I want to share six of them with you. Number one, you can achieve anything, guys, if you put your mind to it. Seriously. There were people, 3,800 of us, in fact, of all shapes and sizes and ages and experience levels, all having a red hot go, an RHG. And I found that so inspiring. It wasn't a bunch of fit cyclists on this ride at all. It was a bunch of people challenging themselves and willing to have a go. So if you put your mind to something in your business that you think may kind of be a little bit scary or you're not up for it, I reckon nine out of 10 times, you're going to surprise yourself very, very pleasantly. Number two, learning from the Great Vic bike ride, talk to more people. I made a point on this ride on the three days that I actually, I got 200 kilometers into it. Hey, that's not bad. 36 degree heat right through to um, hail. It was crazy. But I made a point of talking to lots of people. Some of them thought I was weird. Some of them gave me a grunt as we were struggling up a hill. Others welcomed the opportunity to have a conversation. And I just found in talking to people, you know, that face-to-face -face thing where you eyeball people, keeping your eye on the road, of course, you got to know them. And I think we live in such a virtual world these days that we have to make time to actually instigate conversations. It was kind of interesting being on the bike ride because it was a real community. 
You know, like everyone kind of felt as though that we, we felt as though we were part of one big family. So it was easy to strike up conversations. And sometimes it isn't easy to strike up conversations. You know, you go to those networking events and you're kind of feeling a little bit self-conscious and all that type of stuff. But I encourage you to talk to more people. Ring someone you haven't spoken. Make every day, make a point of, of making a phone call to someone that you haven't spoken to in 12 months someone you'd love to speak to but have never spoken to, and, I don't know, someone else, a prospect, a a past client, whatever it may be. But talking is good. Get off the social media. No more Facebook. Talk. Number three, stories are powerful, and we've all got them. You know, the amount of stories in talking to people, they'd immediately share their story, often unprompted, I rode with some amazing people from the cliched and literally the cliched, and I say this lovingly, but this beautiful man called Barry who was blind, he was deaf, and he was struggling, was battling with cancer, and he was riding on a tandem bike with his mate, inspiring stuff, spent a lovely couple of beers with him at the pub in Yak and Danda, right through to... A couple who were doing schoolies, a guy and a girl who decided that was their schoolie celebration at the end of year 12 and everything in between. But everyone's got a story to tell. Are you telling stories in your business? If you're not, start telling them because they're engaging and they get people emotionally attached to what it is you do. Another learning, set a personal goal each year. I got this from Jeff Kennett when I travelled with him earlier this year, an ex-premier of Victoria, who chose not to come on my show. But that's another story. But he did say, one of the things you've got to do is have a big, hairy, audacious personal goal each year that you set out to achieve. And if you do that, your business is going to benefit from it because you're going to be a better person. And for me this year, it was the Great Vic bike ride. I'm actually devastated that I didn't finish But I'm also elated that I got to um, participate in it. And my big, audacious, hairy personal goal for 2015 is to do the Great Vic bike ride. I'm going to complete it, you know? And having that to work towards, I don't know, it makes me feel good. Um, Every year, I haven't always had a big um, goal to work towards personally. I have in my business, but not personally. We've got to take care of the machine that drives our business, which is us, which is you. Number five, change your business to enable you to do something like take nine days off and go for a bike ride. Um, I was reflecting whilst I was on my bike, (laughs) day one, two or three, how lucky I was to be able to do this with my daughter. Yeah, we've all got holidays owing. Many small business owners don't take them. Yeah, we've got a business to run. But what can you do in your business to help create, I don't think there's anything such thing as passive income, but income that can be generated without you being there, without you selling your hours, yeah? What can you do in order to do that? Because if you are just selling your hours and listening to this, well, you know, I don't need to tell you, but you've only got so many hours in the day. So, you know, either keep putting your prices up and that becomes unmanageable at some point or figure out ways to generate income. And for me, you know, podcasting sort of like that uh, in the sense that I have sponsorship. Um, I also have the Small Business Big Marketing Forum, which allows me to do it from anywhere, except when I've got a broken arm, although I'm managing pretty well with voice to text. But that was interesting in itself. My sixth learning, did I say there was five or six? I'll give you the sixth one. Spend more time with your family. I realized how amazing my beautiful daughter is. Um, if I hadn't have been on the ride, she would have got home. I would have said, how's the ride go? How'd the ride go? She would have said, oh, I was good. It might have been the end of the conversation. I was on that ride and I saw what she did. I saw what she achieved and we just got to hang together. So that's a bit of a tip for the parents amongst us. But I do know that the more time we spend with our family, the better our families are going to be. Just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, I did some time at a charity a few years ago called Reach and um, realized that a whole lot of the kids at risk who were, who were attending the Reach courses were being dropped off in Mercedes and BMWs. And it was because they had a disconnect often with their father. 
Uh, it's a longer story there and happy to tell it one day. But the big point is do spend more time with your family. And if you don't have kids, it doesn't mean, you know, spend more time with your partner, you, you know, your, your own family or whatever it may be. But it's a powerful thing. Uh, if you haven't gathered by now, the ride affected me. I had a ball on it and uh, it, I'm in quite a philosophical mood. But uh, that said, it was a lot of fun. And uh, my arm is killing me. I'm going to see the surgeon tomorrow. I don't think I require an operation. That's good. But, um, you know, accidents happen. But uh, I encourage you all to get out of your comfort zone, set yourself a big goal for 2015, and have some fun. Okay, we have our guest for today coming up very shortly in Paul Greenberg. Fantastic interview, this one. A real, um, some wonderful insights into the future of retailing and some marketing gold, I've got to tell you, dripping from the ceiling. Before we get stuck into Paul, I want to remind you of two great resources that you need in order to do great marketing, to market your business effectively. Number one is 99designs. 99designs is a competition-based website to get anything you want designed, designed inexpensively and quickly in seven days and with a 100% money back guarantee if you don't like the designs, which is very unlikely. So you post your brief on 99 designs, you nominate some prize money, anything from about $199 through to about $1,099. Um, the more, the bigger the prize money, the more designers from around the world are going to respond to your brief. And they respond to your brief with finished designs, not a proposal, finished designs. You choose one, you work with them to get your logo or your brochure or your book cover or your car wrap or whatever it is you're getting designed um, finalized. They release the high-res files to you and you release the prize money to them. It's an amazing, amazing service and you can get anything designed. And if you use the, if you go to the link 99designs.com forward slash s. BBM, that stands for Small Business Big Marketing, you will get a free $99 upgrade to your listing, which will get it in front of 185% more designers. So you've got to love that. Hey, design is very important. We've had many interviews in recent months about the importance of making your marketing look beautiful. Here is your chance. 99 designs. Hey, and the other one, Net Registry. If you want to get your online marketing sorted, head over there, netregistry.com.au. They will get you sorted with a domain name, website hosting, design development, a bit of Google AdWords action. All that stuff that might bother you as a small business owner is sorted very easily over at netregistry.com.au. They are there to get your online marketing sorted and tell them Timbo sent you. Okay, let's get stuck in to today's guest. And a very big thank you to forum member Sean Sullivan of betterbox.com.au, B-E-T-T-A box.com.au. Sean's a longtime forum member, a great contributor, and he hit me up a few weeks ago and said, you've got to get this bloke Paul uh, Greenberg on your show. He knows a thing or two about retailing online and off. So I did. I hit Paul up uh, on Twitter, and he was very, very responsive. Real quick, he came back to me, like within minutes, which I kind of liked. Um, Paul co-founded Deals Direct in 2004, which at the time was a pioneering online department store. It's only like 10 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Look at what's happened since. Uh, he's also a registered shrink, a psychologist, and he is the founder and executive chairman of Nora. He founded Nora, which is the National Online Retailers Association. This is a fascinating chat into where the world of retail is headed. Okay, we talk about the state of online retail, what offline and online retailers are getting wrong. Um, he answers a very interesting question, and there's a business idea in this one. He answers um, what he would do now. I asked him what he would do now if he was starting an online business, and he answers it very specifically. So if you take up his idea and put it into action, please do let me know. I welcomed Paul to the show as the grandfather of online retailing. Wow, I sure wish that was godfather, but uh, unfortunately it is grandfather. You got that right. <laughs> 
Isn't that amazing? Gosh, uh, I read that here somewhere, I think, on the Nora website, which um, basically came from the fact that you started De- Deals Direct in 2004, which it really does make you a grandfather in this space, doesn't it? Well, I think you're, you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a compliment. I take it as a, as a compliment. Uh, I've got teenage sons. I'm not sure they're so happy about their dad being a, a grandfather already. But uh, look, I, I think, uh, yes, 2004 was, was, was uh, still very much pioneering years in uh, pure play online retail in Australia. But to be fair, go, going back before that, I started to tinkering, you know, in the latter part of the 90s in the space. And we can talk a little bit about how I ended up at Deals Direct or I ended up starting Deals Direct. So, but and then of course, last but not least, I'm also slightly older than the average, uh, you know, younger online retailer. So that's how the the grandfather. Yeah, came right. Along. Gosh, you and I are similar. Father of teenagers, it might be a battle of the best dad joke for the next half an hour or so. It could be. Um, now, well, listen, I I got a confession to make. Um, yep. I have become a middle aged man in lycra. I've started bike riding about two months ago, and I asked a fellow cyclist where to buy some bib and brace. And what I meant by that was locally, like where's the local bike shop that I should go to to get some bib and brace? And he suggested go to the UK-based site, wiggle.com. Oh, everyone knows Wiggle, yeah. So, yeah. like, now I buy online, like, don't get me wrong, but uh, I hadn't, and I knew that I was going to have to spend a bit of dough because cycling's not cheap. So I go there, I get my bib and brace. It's half price, right? Um, it's efficient. I got it within, like, five or six days. There were customer reviews on every single product. I was asking questions of the staff, you know, I'm six foot four, which size should I get? Um I now and I have been into my bike, local bike store since then, and I feel really guilty, Paul. So, so, what's all this mean for local retailers? This new online, well, not new, but this this online marketing that is really hitting its straps now. Well, I think the Wiggle example is a great one where, uh, you know, initially, and when I say initially, you know, three, four years ago, we all got a bit of a panic as retailers in Australia. We saw this flat world. I mean, because let's face it, we're living now in a global borderless retail. We all had a bit of an anxiety attack. We thought, well, we're going to be invaded by the barbarians and our lunch is going to be eaten. And we'll talk a bit about the price inequities. But I'm actually, uh, particularly with my Nora hat on, I'm shifting that. I'm saying we've actually got an enormous opportunity. Yes, the the world is now flat. There's no questions about that. The digital age has flattened the world in uh, ways we could never have foreseen. But that means our addressable market as a retail industry goes from, you know, the 25, 26 million Australian population to billions. Mm -hmm. And I actually think there's much more of an opportunity than a challenge. But I'm happy to talk through that wiggle example if your listeners are interested or you think there would be. Well, Um, I just think that's what – let's get – like that's the pointy end. Like we can talk – and I am interested to ask you after this discussion about some of the trends that we're seeing in online retail because I think it's worth looking forward. This this thing's happening so fast. But let's pull apart the wiggle example. Right, so Wiggle are fabulous. Uh, I, I met their CEO who was out in Sydney a year ago, and that's also exciting. Remember, these guys come out. He's actually moved on now, a fellow by the name of Humphrey Cobalt, but he came out. You know, you can learn from these guys, but they are, as you mentioned, they're the, the, the king to the mammal, the middle-aged man in Lycra, and we're all one of them. Um, <laughs> but they, they've really pioneered, innovated, and disintermediated um, what was traditionally very much a, a, a corner store business. You know, mm-hmm. we used to buy our kids' bikes and our bikes and our accessories down from the local retailer. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, you know, uh, that was often a, a – you know, it, it was – you know, Australia has got a higher cost base to do business. Yes. And we don't have the volume. We have, we have Our addressable market is our population, which is pretty tiny. Now, Wiggle is based out of the UK. Uh, they've obviously, they sell globally. The world is their oyster. Uh, they've got a, a lower cost base in the UK. Not that much lower, but certainly lower than Australia. Yeah, I wouldn't have and thought it would be significantly lower, but clearly they've got volume. They've got huge volume. They're a global business, and they've got a little bit of a lift up in terms of um, uh, supply chain and distribution. It, it does seem to be uh, that it's a, it's a little cheaper to be shipping from London to Sydney than it is from Sydney to London, and we can talk a bit about that too. So let's give them the heads up that they had a, a, a leap on us, and they've come out of the box blazing, fabulous customer experience. It is a pure play model, 
So uh, pure you know, play be, meaning there is no offline on, presence. Uh, there is no offline for now, but o- online only, which traditionally has been assumed has got a lower cost base, and I think it does if you exclude the shipping. But this is where it excites me. So I was talking to those same, same mom and pop retailers that I used to buy my bike from. They were saying this wiggle's going to kill us, and I'm afraid for many uh, who put up the white flag. Uh, it did. It did mean either the end of their business or a shift. But those who are happy to to roll with it are now partnering with businesses like Wiggle and doing the value add service. So if you buy a bike from Wiggle, which you can, and invariably you can buy it a lot cheaper than you buy it here. Buy anything. Who the, who the hell is going to assemble it for you? Mm-hmm. Who's going to check it for safety? Who's going to make sure your pedals are adjusted correctly? And uh-huh. that is where your 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 community based bike retailer still has a significant future and in fact moves up the value chain from a kind of I'm going to beat Wiggle on price, which you can never do, to I'm going to partner, I'm going to, I'm going to align. This is going to grow the size of the pie. There's far more mammals on the road. I mean, I, I mean you know, we, we, we're all on the road now. There's, mm-hmm. there's pelotons everywhere. Mm-hmm. The pie is getting bigger. How do I get my clip of the ticket? And the clip of the ticket is invariably around services and value add. Okay, so let's just – I'm going to put – I'm going to be – the local bike shop, right? Yep. And and listeners, please be um be a retailer in this instance. And right now we're talking bikes, but I'm sure what you're going to say can apply to other industries. Just about. So what what you're saying, and uh, therefore I'm if I listen to what you're saying and don't put up the white flag, Paul, maybe what I should do is um take some space, uh, get off the high street because rents are high. Uh, take some space in an industrial estate and advertise the fact that I'm here to put your bike together. To, to, totally. Go one step further. Wiggle. Will, will, you contact Wiggle and, and, and declare yourself a partner. You, you, you will be the Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne or the suburb South Melbourne partner of Wiggle. Wow. And in, I have no doubt that they will then support you with this because they also need support, uh, reverse logistics, returns, repairs, servicing. So these global pure players are also looking to partner with people on the ground. Uh, they, am I? Am I? If I'm in the back stalls of the the industrial estate, and I've I've interviewed a couple of businesses over the last couple of years who have literally gone off the high street into the industrial estate. One was a brewery, the other a cafe. Yeah, but yeah. Um, uh, am I now just assembling bikes? Because my customers, okay, they've bought their bike, which I've assembled uh, off Wiggle. They're, they're going to go back to Wiggle and buy all the accessories, which I'm guessing is greater margin. So, am I selling any any product now, or just a service? Well, you're certainly saying to customers, you're not going to be able to beat Wiggle on price. And you're being upfront with your customer. You're saying, look, who can, no one can beat Wiggle, but your customer will from time to time need something immediately. He might have a race on that day. He'll need a tube. He'll need something. He might need a new saddle that's cocked it. You know, time is still, is still a challenge for consumer direct retail. Mm-hmm. So there'll be plenty of occasions where if you're keeping the, 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 the essentials, you're keeping the, the consumables, and you're keeping the essentials, that your customer will need stuff in real time. And by the way, is happy to pay for the privilege of you holding that stock for him. Mm-hmm. But I, I think, yes, I think you're finding that there'll be more a shift towards a service base. You'll still sell product. There's still plenty of people who want to buy locally, and that's terrific news for our industry. There's still plenty of people who are happy to pay a bit more to get local service. So it's not a zero-sum game either or. But I think, yes, your, your business location becomes a little less important in my view, particularly with leave like social media and mobility where you can pull the customers a little closer into you you don't have to sort of hijack them on the high street um, so it does become you you can move a little bit out of the high street bring your rents down and then focus on that service piece because, so okay yeah so, so this example of wiggle uh, does play beautifully into the model you've just described which is become the service provider partner with wiggle don't fight them join them um, and and as you're as you're talking, I'm thinking, wow, you know, okay, now maybe as a bike retailer, what I could be doing is running information sessions and charging people, become an educator, become the person who puts on um, events or, you know, you could you could blow that out into quite an interesting business if you choose if you chose to. Uh, and that works because Wiggle have got things that need assembling. What about uh, if I've got the clothes shop? I've got a 14-year-old daughter. Uh, I reckon... Uh, it's a ha- it's a podcaster's ha- um, dilemma because there's a knock at the door every day from a Australia Post truck delivering another piece of clothing. <laughs> so um, w- what what does that mean? Because the, the clothes shop can't they've got nothing to assemble. Do they just shut down? Look, 
I think there's an important trend that I think we need to discuss, and, and in many ways you might have discussed it with your listeners and some of your guests, Tim, but disintermediation is a fancy word for something very simple. It's the removal of the middleman. Uh, its root word is intermediary. Yeah, and right. disintermediary. The, there is going to be a challenge. There's been a challenge for retail. There's still a challenge for retail, and there's a bigger challenge coming that for those retailers that are simply selling I mean, let me try not disrespect, but simply selling other people's product and taking a margin for the privilege, mm-hmm. it's not going to get easier, uh, in my view, unless you're innovating, you're creating something special. So to me… You know, and to and then just your, on that p- point, yeah. creating something special could be, and we've spoken about this in, in previous episodes, an experience. Like Definitely. The, the one thing you do, well, well, there is an experience in every business transaction, good, bad, or indifferent. But, yep. you know, a retailer like General Pants, right? Um, yep. They stock lots of different brands. And going into that store as a young person, and I go in there with my kids, it's an experience. It's cool. You know, the staff are cool. There's music playing, there's displays. Um, so if you're not offering that, then you are really just occupying space, yeah? I couldn't have put it better myself, absolutely. <laughs> there still is, of course, plenty of legs for selling other brands, but you have to create what they call curation and, 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 and theatre. You've got to create an environment where your customers want to come and congregate and commune and experience. Right. And if you're doing that, then again, much like the Wiggle example, you're moving to the value add. You're not just putting out your wares, putting a ticket on them and saying, here we go. You'll get a bit of business like that, but it's going to be hard to sustain it. And so those good retailers that are selling you know, other people Brands. And, and by the way, I'm quite bullish about our department stores, particularly our David Jones and Meyer. I think they're coming back stronger. Hmm. I mean, in many ways, they've done two things to, 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 ch- to challenge this intermediation, the way retail is moving. Well, number one, they've built their own house brands or they've bought them. So, for example, uh, Meyer would own a Sasson, I think it's pronounced Sasson Bide, which hmm. is a very popular women's fashion, uh, Australian women's fashion business. That, so you can only really get it at Meyer or at outlets that they select. It's their business, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, they're creating more experience and more theatre in store so that people want to come and be entertained. And, and you know, Meyer's recent advertising, you know, yes. um, it really speaks right to that. So we're seeing a pretty powerful response by retailers realizing that things are changing and, you know, by the way, uh, you know, you walk down the high street and you, you see brands like Nespresso, Apple, Samsung, Zara, Nike, Swarovski. Hmm. Uh, I could go on forever. Well, what, what is different about those retailers? Well, they own the product in their store. Yes. Now, that's, yeah, that's interesting. You've just that's answered a question of mine. So, listeners, uh, we're in Melbourne and um, we've just had a big uh, – it's not a department store, but a shopping complex built in the CBD called Emporium. I walked around it when it opened a few months ago, Paul, and I'm looking and going – Geez, you know, um, this is really interesting. They're all one branch stores. There's, there's, there's some depart. There is a couple of department stores. That Japanese one, which I can never pronounce the name of, not Dry Glow, but whatever it is, Uniqlo. Uniqlo. Yeah. Um, yeah. But these are all one brand. So there's the New Balance and there's the Timberland and the Swarovski. And so yeah. I get it now. So these guys, they own that brand. I can buy them online for the same price they're selling in store. So they kind of got the mix right. Yeah. They have, and I guess probably one of the pinnacles of our conversation will be the message that I'd love to leave with your listeners that customers think by brand, not by channel, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that when we talk about online retail. Well, let's uh, go. Don't no powder, no powder to be kept dry right here. What what do yeah. you mean by that? Well, so you know, naturally, uh, as head of the National Online Retailers Association, uh, people come to me all the time and say, "Well, is online better than offline?" Will online um, eat the offline lunch? You know, bricks and mortar is the bigger sort of uh, part of the business. Uh, online is always going to be a sideshow. And the key point that I think everyone's missing, and perhaps including myself, because uh, I came from online retail, is that customers don't think by channel. Hmm. They think by brand. Yes. So if you're calling yourself a bricks and mortar retailer, you've probably got a bit of work to do. But I'd also challenge some of the, you know, the young guns in the pure play, the online area, so that if you're calling yourself an online retailer, you've probably also got a bit Fall of work to do. Fall into the same do. trap. You say to your customer, I've got one channel to market, and like it or lump it, like it or lump it. And I think customers are rewarding multiple touch points. So the reason I segue into this is you spoke about brand, and that's really where customers are focused, whether mm-hmm. it be a Timberland, whether it be a Black Milk, whether it be a Zara, brand is king, and we've mm-hmm. all got to remember that. 
Yeah, I had the black milk guys on a couple of years ago. Wow, was that a good conversation or what? Um, it, uh, in fact, one of those guys isn't. Uh, he's on the board, isn't he, of Nora? Well, in fact, they're not on the board of Nora, but I love what they've done. And I guess since you've spoken to them, they've continued to shoot the lights out. In fact, we're taking a whole lot of Nora members up at the early December. We're doing a full tour of the Black Milk facility. So I'm very impressed. Talk about a poster child poster for a new, Australian, a new Australian retail. And very proud what of what they, those guys have done. What they do so beautifully is build community. I mean, when I was speaking, I was speaking to Cameron, and yep. Cameron had, uh, it was around Christmas time. In fact, it was just after Christmas, and they were so under the pump at their Brisbane um, manufacturing facility. These guys, by the way, listeners, make leggings. And they were so under the pump that their online tribe or their tribe got online on the Facebook and started and arranged for masseurs to go around to headquarters to start to massage some of the staff so that they could, um, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of love in that room. A lot of love. A lot of love. So, okay, so great point. We buy, we do buy by brand. We don't buy by channel. But mind you, my kids would much rather buy a pair of um, Levi jeans from, uh, from General Pants than going to Meyer to buy them. So they're still choosing brand. They still, of course, they've chosen general brand over Meyer, and and absolutely makes sense to me. So they 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 are shopping by brand, and and by the way, you know they'll, they'll sometimes go to the general pants store, and and sometimes they'll buy from the general pants website. And I think you'll find if you speak to your kids, it's, it's not always that conscious. It just depends on budget, location, mm. uh, convenience, availability, and all the above. Mm. So brands first. The general pants is their brand of choice. Great. And then the channel's almost a secondary. Well, where, where are we today? You know, chocolate, yeah. strawberry, vanilla. So, Paul, does it mean – because one thing I love about – one of the marketing kind of truisms is creating an experience, is building an emotional attachment. A, a, a part of that is the human experience. Um, I felt there was a little bit of human experience when I dealt with Wiggle because I was going onto their discussion board and asking about size and about quality and getting pretty quick responses, not immediate, but quick responses. Um, but, you know, how did we, what are the good online pure play retailers doing to ensure that we don't, they're not just, it's not just a price argument? Look, that's a powerful point, and right into my sweet spot. You know, I'm a psychologist by profession, and and particularly interested in organisational psychology and consumer behaviour. And that's the spectrum. I mean, if we want to go into the broad brackets, you start with Jeff Bezos, who's a bit of he's he's one of my heroes, obviously. You know, for the founder of Amazon, Mm -hmm. Uh, he said the best customer service is no customer service. So let's just, let's just think about that. The best customer service is no customer service. Yep. And when I read that quote 10 years ago, I got it. What he was trying to say is give control, give the wheel to the shopper. And if the, if the shopper is in control and they can do everything themselves, in other words, they don't need you, they, you, they're in control, you've got a beautiful, seamless customer experience. And I get that, but I partly agree with it because i think on the other extreme is my other favorite example my other hero is a fellow tony shea who founded Mm zappos.com and they the shoe store pure play out of las vegas now if you call zappos and you get one of their customer service folk and you want them to order a pizza for you they'll do it if you want to chat about how your kids are going at school they'll give you a half an hour of of, of their time no no problem Mm -hmm. so you've got bezos who's very metric driven uh, you know, obviously keen to make sure that customers help themselves because it keeps the cost base down and builds his efficiency. That the best customer service is no customer service, automate or perish. And on the other hand, you've got perhaps a little bit of overcompensation, one might argue, because of the you know, the digital model where you don't f- face-to-face with your customer, you've got, uh, you know, pure players offering, uh, obvious, first of all, multiple touch points, including uh, live chat and telephony, as well as email, providing sort of ridiculous levels of customer service, really sort of I- I- extreme connection, for want of a better word. Mm-hmm. So there, those are the two brackets. I guess probably somewhere in the middle is the truth. Uh, customers do want an emotional connection with a the brand. They do want to be gotten. And I think using your Wiggle example, it's clearly been a satisfying experience because they've been able to solve your problems and speak to you in a personal way, despite the fact you, you know they've got millions of customers. And, and that's a pretty darn good feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I think there's a, there's a broad bracket, and, 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 and often that's going to depend on the business model you run, 
the margins uh, that you're dealing with, um, you know, your kind of uh, your infrastructure, there's a number of questions. But there's two very broad examples and try and pick your place in the middle. Paul, I, I want to go back and finish the loop on the idea of the the clothing retailer who, what you said earlier, interesting, like get out of the way if you are just the middleman. Get out of the way if you are just selling other people's brands and if you're not offering a super duper experience that will encourage people to come into your store. So just to be clear, and I want to start talking about trends now, those guys we are going to see the demise of uh, is, is, is what I hear you say, yeah? Look, I think I, I, I'm very optimistic about Australian retail, but I don't want to be a Pollyanna. We've already seen an, a lot of attrition in the space, and we've seen a lot of those sort of subpar retailers who've relied simply on clipping the ticket, um, not providing any value add in the mm. chain. They, they, they're either gone or, or they're on their way. I'm obviously keen to see a renaissance, and I believe we, we're in the beginning of a technology-led retail renaissance in Australia that's very broad, and that if we take the wave – the clever country, the Asian century in, in a global technology-led retail, this could well be our time. But but unfortunately, those who won't cross the Rubicon will, will get caught in the floods. Okay, so, so what have they got to do to cross it, Paul? What have they got to – because we're seeing like, you know, the biggest shopping centre in Australia, in fact, it may even be the Southern Hemisphere, which is Chadston in Victoria. They're about to do this massive expansion, like more shops. Really? Like, I don't get it. I don't get the business model. I've got it. My boy's finishing uh, school this year. He's been doing business management. And, it, and throughout the year, he's gone, Dad, how does that shop make money? And sometimes I can tell him, and other times I just shake my head and go, Jack, I don't know. I don't know, mate. Um, so we, are, we see these retail shops open, these, these um, department stores or these shopping centers increase their footprint. W- what, are we, what are the ones, the retailers that are listening, got to do to cross the chasm and continue to compete? Well, the first thing, I think those, 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 those Westfields and the Chats, and I think they're very smart people, and I think they're doing 100% the right thing. My late father actually taught me this. He was an aviator, and, he, and I said to him, Dad, he said to me once, if a plane's um, in a stall, you know, heading towards the ground, what do you do? And I said, well, you pull back so you can pull the nose up. He said, no, exactly the opposite. You push down as hard as you can, and that's what will pull you out of your dive. And these retailers have worked it out, these big Westfields, their, their new centers are going to be better, more glorious, more glamorous, more, more, more of, a, of a theater, uh, you know, more of a cathedral than ever before. And, that will bring, and that's pushing into the dive, which is a super smart thing to do as opposed to pulling out of it. And they, the shoppers are, are flooding back to stores in droves, and they're doing some very innovative things, uh, straddling the cusp between digital and physical, which is really where the honey pot is. Okay, so what can the little guys, the, the ones that are listening to this, learn from how do they push down? The first thing is the little guy's got a shop. Here's the good news. Well done. You've got a shop. So the, the worst thing you can be doing is saying, oh, my God, I've got to get into online, which means I've got to close my shop. Wrong. Wrong. Your physical location is a significant asset, and don't minimize it. You've done a lot of the hard yards. You've made a lot of investment in physical infrastructure, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very important part. Customers do want multiple touch points. They want to physically engage with you, but you dare not do a uni-channel model. If you're just relying on your shop for footfall, you're not going to make it. You have to have that digital umbilical cord to your shopper. So my challenge to you is when a, sh- when a shopper comes into your store, and whether they're buying something or, or better still when they don't buy something, what do you do with that shopper? The guy who's walked in, he's had a look around. You've traditionally asked him, can I help you? He's traditionally said, no, I'm, I'm just looking. And he leaves. And the tinkle of the bell is he leaves the door. That is the wrong thing to do. That shopper needs to be induced, encouraged to connect with you in another way. And what are those ways? Well, the simple way is to say to the guy, look, how about giving me your email address? And by the way, no customer is going to give you an email address unless you give them something. Now, what mm-hmm. could that be? A little gift, a discount of coupon on his next purchase, something. Don't expect nothing with him. What's in it for me? The customer will give you his email address if you give him something. And you've got to find out what that something is. It doesn't have to be anything big. But then the minute you've got an email address, you've got an ability to connect with that customer whether you send him a monthly EDM, whether you cre- you, you've got what I call a digital umbilical cord, a golden thread. The other way is to say to him, look, you know, would you mind if, uh, would, you, would you come on t- uh, onto our Facebook wall and, and just have a look at what we're doing? You need to make sure that there's ongoing connection because customers move. 
-hmm. And sometimes they're online and sometimes in the physical environment and you want them to remember you. So uni channel models are out. It's very hard. It's going to get harder to be just online only, particularly as things get more competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm talking in generalism. There's ob obviously niches where that doesn't apply. But in broad terms, it's going to be harder to be a bricks and mortar retailer. You're going to have to em embrace the digital divide, and it's not that difficult. Okay, so b bricks and mortar, if the bricks and mortar retailer, the one or two or three store uh, retailer who's listening now goes, oh, it sounds like Paul is saying that I need to uh, get a digital footprint, and that doesn't mean just a website or having a Facebook page. What you're suggesting is an e-commerce platform. Um, so therefore, is it simply, and you're getting this, um, uh, this uh, what did you call it? The uh, um, the digital digital umbilical cord. I've, they've yeah. got you've got the email address of the customer. So do you go and set up a, a little e commerce, a Shopify part of your your website, and just sell what you're selling in store online, or what what do I do? What am I what am I offering them online that they can't get offline? Totally. So of course, the good news is a, a Shopify website. What would it cost you? It costs you a hundred dollars to set up WordPress maybe a little less than that. So you're not talking about big beer. I don't want to oversimplify this, but it's not huge dollars to get involved. No, and not. absolutely, yes, you've got to offer your customer the multiple touch point. And so uh, if your product lends itself to be to home delivery or cons uh, consumer direct delivery, then there's no question you should have a website. And what is your message to your customer? We love you to come into our store, but when you can't, we're still open for business. Mm -hmm. It's a simple pragmatic and obvious message we love you to come to our store but we know you're busy and when you can't we're still here for you and you know where we are and you know if you've got a problem you know where to find us because we've been here for a long time but you have to have that digital connection okay so to me i've got my, I've got my retailer hat i'm the clothes shop, shop owner now i've gone and yeah. Yeah. i've got my shopify section of my website now of my online store happening but that's just a 24-7 argument. And we've argued, you know, the internet, one of the g game changes about the internet is that, you know, we could get anything any time of the day or night. So yep. where is, um, where's the magic now? We're in 2014, soon to be 2015. Where's the added magic that I have to put on beyond just having uh, an e-commerce section of my website? Well, absolutely. The honeymoon's over mm. uh, for pure play online retail. I mean, you know, it was a bit magical and I had the best of it, you know, around that 2004 to yeah. 2010, you know, where it really felt like uh, we were creating something new. But in fairness, consumers are king and, uh, and queen and they're raising the bar. So the new magic, just by the way, I don't want to digress, is uh, three-hour delivery, for example, or, uh, or, or 90 minute delivery or click and collect, you know, uh, th th there's new magic, but the old magic of a website, well, that's just retail now. Well, so it's a ticket to the game. It's ticket to the game. Remember, brand first, channel second. So the customer likes your brand. He's in your store. He's coming to your store for a reason. He likes what you're doing. Uh, he's going to buy online from you, not because online is sexy, because sometimes he just can't get to your shop. Mm -hmm. And you've got to offer him that 24-hour touch point. It's less about magic. It's more just about convenience. I'd say it's more about respect. I mean, you know, what, what, what would you – I mean, you can't say to your customer, well, I'm going to close my shop at 2 o'clock today because I don't feel like staying open. And similarly, you can't say, well, I'm not going to have a website because I just don't feel like servicing you after hours. Mm. Uh, they've grown to expect it. It's the new norm. Yeah, okay. So adding value, adding extreme service, three-hour delivery. I'm seeing that. I saw that um, Amazon are delivering in some parts. Is it of Seattle by drone? Um, that's crazy. That's like that sounds like instant delivery. Um, is that real or is that still in? I don't know whether that's in play now. But there's a YouTube video where you've literally got drones landing in your driveway with a, pa a package from Amazon. Um, no, that's uh, look. I, I don't want to. I mean, I love innovation, but uh, I don't, but uh, to your listeners, I don't want to create too much uh, uh, Kool Aid. You know, blue sky here. Uh, three hour delivery is not for everybody. It's it's expensive. It's for the select few, and I'd say those retailers, particularly in fashion, higher up the the value chain, dealing with the bigger end of town mm -hmm. uh, in metropolitan cities, um, someone's got to pay for it, and it's costed. But you don't have to do that. And certainly the drone example, Tim. Well, that's. 
that's uh, Bezos is talking about it, but it's certainly not active yet. I can tell you uh-huh. the, the Civil Aviation Authority will have a little bit to do with that before <laughs> that gets off the ground. But uh, I like what I've, uh, you've got to encourage that kind of innovation because who knows one day, I'm sure it'll be a reality, but not yet. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, totally. Okay, so the, the magic is in the added, the, the added value that you put into just now being open 24 7. And I guess as the clothes shop owner, too, if I am selling online, sure, I can tell my customers who come into my store who are locals, but now now the world's opened up to me. Now, that uh, theoretically, yes, it has, but ha- how true is it? Is it really, am I really going to get someone, you know, I've got my little clothes shop in Melbourne. Is someone really from Sussex, England going to buy from me? What was that sitcom where they say, I've only got two words to say to you? No, it was from Kath and Kim. <laughs> I've only got two words to say to you, uh, Tim, black milk. <laughs> you know, we you know, little couple of young guys in a garage in in Brisbane. Yep. You know, started knocking together some leggings on a homemade sewing machine. Yep. And now they can't keep up with demand globally. Mm. Forget about locally. They've certainly got their local fans, but globally, it's a massive global business. By the oh, way, okay. manufacturing in Brisbane, distributing out of Brisbane. Yep. Uh, you know, black okay, milk. here's the thing, and I'm being I'm being the cynic. Okay, amazing story, it is, and I will put a link in the notes to this episode to the black milk. Uh, yep. discussion because it was incredible uh, one of the things that I tried to balance in and I've been doing this show for five years and I talk from stage about marketing all the time and there's this balance between amazing so you've got the excellent you know left and right scale uh, amazing and helpful right amazing as a marketing strategy is really hard to do uh, yes. it, it, we should all strive for it but Black Milk do amazing marketing. They really do. They build their cool. They've got a tribe. They just do crazy stuff. Yep. And, and then you've just got Helpful. And I love Helpful because Helpful's easy. You help your yep. customer and your prospect make an informed decision, and they may well buy from you, and price may become less less important. So you've spoken – Black Milk's amazing. So how can we pull back – and say to the offline retailer, it's okay, you don't have to be black milk. Tim, you're absolutely my kind of guy. You look, <laughs> I, 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 I'm your, your mere mortal. You know, I, I agree with you. I think we love to, these guys shine a light for us, but we're, we're not those. Not everyone can win the lotto, right? Mm-hmm. But, but there is so much example of smaller businesses, some home-based, who are selling a niche product, you know, look at on your desk, just a small niche product, ideally with a bit of Australiana on it or something that you can add value mm-hmm. and are selling it around the world. You know, my late grandfather used to say to me many, many, when I was a baby, so well, well when I was a 15-year-old a long time ago, you know, if you could sell one thing to every bloke in China, every person in China, <laughs> you know, it was almost a metaphor. Now, of course, you can. You can. <laughs> you know, um, and that's really the world. The world is our oyster. And if you could sell, find a product, a line, a bit of Australiana, Something that's unique, something that's a little bit different that you can really add value. You don't have to be uh, 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 amazing. You don't have to be exceptional. Mm. You have to be helpful. You have to be, you know, diligent. Mm. And but the world is waiting for you. Brand Australia is open for business. And there's far there's there's demand for what we are, we've got. We've just got to get out and take it. It is not yeah. that difficult. Yeah, and, and and I will. I'll put another caveat on the amazing thing. Uh, my daughter. In fact, I've interviewed the girls from Frank Body Scrub, a wonderful uh, online business out of Melbourne. Um, they sell a, a caffeinated body scrub. My daughter buys it, and she talks. I've talked to Steph about it, and the excitement of it arriving in the post because it comes in really cool packaging, in a really cool envelope with a really cool note. And it's got, you know, it's beautifully designed. So there is experience. And it's amazing. It's not hard to be that. It's not that amazing. It's not hard. It just, it just put some effort into design. So um, it, it can be done. And I always want marketing to be achievable for anyone who's listening. That's my, you know. Hey, Paul, um, we are going to, in a minute, finish this interview and then do an exclusive series of Q&A for my four members. But, but just before we finish, one last question. You set up Deals Direct in 2004. Um, you did the happy dance every day for six or so years as the, the, the register went ka-ching, ka-ching throughout the day and throughout the night. <laughs> if, if you were setting up an online business today, what would you sell? What are the first three things you'd do? And how would you market it? Now, that's an episode in itself. But just, you know, top of your head, go. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'll start off a quick quote. Get big, get niche, or get out. I've heard that bandied around. I'd go niche. So Deals Direct was an everything to all men. I wouldn't go there. It's bloody hard. It's expensive. It's hard yak. I'd find a niche product. 
So that's to answer the first part of your question. It would be a niche product with a strong Australian theme, but it would be a global product. So in other words, uh, Australia to the world. What the do you mean? Part the, uh, hold the second part. What do you mean with Australian Australian theme? So I think Brand Australia, and this is my passion, is an underestimated brand. I don't think we realize how much gravitas there is for our brands in China, Europe, and the rest of the world. Huh. Um, I, I think we've always known we've got a bit of edge, and, and I hate to use Black Milk again or Aussie Bama, all these examples, but mm. I think it's way deeper than – in fact, I know. I've had calls from the people at Amazon saying, we've got searches for Australia that we can't yeah. fulfill. So I would find something that's uniquely Australian, but of course not just quirky. And we're not talking just a, a hat with bobbing corks, you no. know. Something a little, a little classier than that. And I would go to the world with a brand Australia wow. uh, uh, view. Right, there's range, a business idea. Small range, handful of products, but with a strong Australian theme. Okay, first three things you'd do to get your uh, new retail store up and running. I would go into a marketplace. Uh, marketplaces are terrific. I would start as I did back in the late 90s. I'd start on eBay and Amazon and uh, Tmall and, and Taobao in China and uh, Trade Me in New Zealand. So I'd start first on marketplaces. I wouldn't, I'd open a website, but I wouldn't lose too much sleep about that. I'd hit the marketplaces as hard as I could. Why? There's hundreds of millions of shoppers waiting for you on those marketplaces. You don't have to worry about being found. Mm, well, that answers the third question. How do you market it? marketplaces will do it for you. They will. And once you've got that shopper and you've found him on the marketplace, well, he's your shopper and he'll come back to your brand every day of the week. But go and find him in a marketplace. It's much easier. You're, um, I just want to go back to point one about the uh, niche and being Australian. My, I have, this show gets downloaded in 110 countries, including Kazakhstan and Madagascar. So, so what, uh, uh, what is, they just, they've, they've got to find the niche. Uh, you've identified locally an Australian product as being a niche, but find a yeah. niche. Don't be big. And to your listeners in Madagascar, your yeah. listeners, I'd say that there's probably demand for their product around the globe, and I've, I wish them well because the world is flat. It's global retail, and they should be very proud of what they've got in their yeah. own backyard, and they should market it to the world. Oh, Paul, I have thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. I'm looking forward to the Q&A for forum members after this, but um, uh, really good discussion. I'm going to guess there's probably some listeners who have either stopped listening because they're infuriated, uh, maybe scared, Maybe, maybe despondent. Maybe they've raised the white flag. But maybe, on the other hand, too, there's a whole lot of listeners who are now got a renewed vigour around their offline business. Thank you for adding to that. Either way, pleasure, Tim. What about that team? Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did bringing it to you. I love Paul's um, decisiveness, his clarity around where the world of online retailing is headed and where the offline retailers should be focusing. I've got um, five, a top five, thanks to Net Registry and the guys at 99designs.com. Number one, I love that quote, get big, get niche, or get out. Loved that advice. In particular, then, how he kind of related it to um, the wiggle story that I told and what bike retailers could be doing. But that relates to all sorts of other retailers as well. Number two, the best customer service is no customer service. Get out of the way of your customer. I think we, we can sometimes get sucked into kind of over-servicing and getting in the way of the transaction. I think Amazon do it really well with their kind of one-click policy. You know, the bottom line is no one ever goes shopping for customer service. We go shopping to buy a product or a service. Number three, learning from Paul. If you're the middleman and offering no additional value, then get out of the way or at least start adding value. Start adding extreme value, you know. Listen to that interview I did a few weeks ago um, with, oh, what was the fellow's name? He it was. It was all about creating magic moments. I'll put a link in the show notes. His name escapes me at the moment, but um, you can add value in all sorts of ways. If you listen, look, basically listen to any past episode of this podcast, and you'll figure out how to add value. Number four, customers think by brand, not by channel. How true is that? You don't go. Oh, I'm going to. Um, you know, I'm going to target 
No, you think I'm going – well, actually, Target is a brand. Um, You don't think I'm going to uh, a particular department store. You think I'm going to buy a particular brand. So brand, how important is branding? Got a whole section in the classroom on how to uh, understand the fundamental pillars of your brand, uh, the classroom of the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. Number five lesson, love this one. Email is a digital umbilical cord. I like that. Are you collecting the email addresses of your clients, of your prospects? I do hope so. We've spoken about this long and hard, guys, in previous episodes. Um, I do. If you go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, on the home page, in fact, on every page, you have the opportunity to give me your email and we can start communicating. I'll give you a 20-minute free video um, on um, marketing, um, forgotten marketing concepts And it's a way of me being able to add you to my list and provide value bit by bit as we get to know each other. So do collect emails, do start a database. Um, As I said in that interview, head over to the forum because there is a wonderful, about a 16, 18 minute Q&A that I recorded with Paul where forum members got to answer, uh, ask him specific questions. Ha! Boy, oh boy. A lot of marketing gold there. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay, couple of sections left before we farewell you for the week. Uh, I've got a listener question, and then I've got the motivational marketing quote of the week. What do you want first? Question? Quote? Quote? Question? I'm going to go question. It's from um, David Patterson. He says, hi, Timbo. I've been listening to your podcast for the last couple of months. Huh, you're the one. And Andy goes on to say, I've heard some really good ones. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I have got some obscure ideas from them. <laughs> well, Dave, is that a good thing? I hope it is. Is obscure good? Obscure says weird to me. Anyway, he goes on to say, my problem is working out how to implement all of them into my accounting practice. Aha. Uh-huh. Accounting and the town I live in seems to be extremely conservative. Sounds you like you're living in a small town with small minds, Dave. Hey, is that the truth? I am just trying to work out how to implement some of the marketing options that come from your podcasts. Hopefully, I can get the courage to implement some of them soon. I like the idea of being a a disturber in my industry. Love your work, Dave. It's a good question, mate. Here's some ways of getting some stuff implemented. Number one, my guest last two weeks ago, Michelle Bridges. What did she say? JFDI. Just freaking do it. Yeah, implement something. It, It sounds simplistic, but do. Just do something. Number two, Dave, choose one. Right? Don't go, oh, I've got 10 ideas from the last 10 episodes of Tim's show. That'll overwhelm you. Choose one and go for gold, Dave. Go for marketing gold. Another idea, hand the tasks over. Don't do them all yourself. You're an accountant, mate. You've got to balance the books. You've got to get the left and the right ledgers sorted out and the P&Ls and the, you know, all that, those acronyms. So don't do it yourself. Go to 99designs and, and set a design competition if you need a brochure designed. Go to Net Registry to get your website sorted or go to Elance and find a VA or just don't do it all yourself. I've spoken in previous episodes and I speak in the forum all the time about this concept of the virtual marketing team. You've got to get one, Dave. You can't do it all yourself, mate. Another idea, head over to episode 209 where Griffo and I dedicate an hour to getting stuff done, to how, on how to get stuff done. We give you lots of ideas there. Another tip, Dave, don't make it bigger than it is. You know, you're looking at all these ideas, a bit overwhelmed, can't see the forest for the trees, all that stuff. It's not as big as you think, mate, hey? So just have a go at JFDI and... How do you eat an elephant, Dave? One bite at a time. So don't look at the elephant. Just look at his toenail and have a good old chew on that. All right. As we slowly limp to the finish line of episode 
What is this episode? Episode 217 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Australia's number one marketing podcast, by the way. I have got a marketing quote to share with you. Don't know who wrote this. It says anon, but I love it. Here it is. Stop trying to sell with marketing, hyphen. Instead, use marketing to help customers buy. (laughs) Gotta love that. I'll read it quicker. Stop trying to sell with marketing. Instead, use marketing to help customers buy. Good marketing does that. Helpful marketing does that. I hear there's a book called Helpful Marketing coming out in the new year. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more. Righto. I reckon that's about it. Next week, I've got this fellow, Simon Griffiths. He makes toilet paper. He's got a business called Who Gives a Crap? How rude. It's good, though. He's a social entrepreneur. A bit like Daniel Flynn from Thank You Water, doing good things for the world and for toilets around the world. So uh, stay tuned for that. Got some great interviews in the can and getting very close to securing a very big name guest for early 2015. Look out for that one. Uh, Big thank you to Net Registry and 99designs. Head over to 99designs.com forward slash SBBM. Get some stuff designed. Head over to netregistry.com.au. Tell them Timbo sent you. Get your online marketing sorted. Head over. Here's another one crankmymarketing.com, join the forum. I'm in there every day. Even though I've got one arm, I'll take you on. Voice to text, left-handed typing, I can do it. That's it for now. May your marketing be the very best marketing. Have a great week. I'm Timbo Reid. See you next week. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.